OK, so we finally finished developing our model of computation. And so we have kind of a fully fleshed out and, and well understood model of computation that we're going to be using. However, you know, what we want to ask about is computation in general. The idea of computation is not necessarily the idea of a Turing machine. It's the idea of, of something more broad and general than that. Um, so what we, but what we would detected is, in, in a lot of different ways, we've detected uh, that in a lot of ways the model doesn't matter. And that's kind of what the Church Turing thesis says. So I, I think we need to, before moving on, kind of, of say this outright. And there's a lot of different ways to say, there's a lot of different ways to explain what the Church Turing thesis is saying. Um, there are many equivalent ways to word this. Um, and I'm not sure really what the best one is. I think the best way to word this is all of these ways. So by model of computation, uh, we mean you know, a well understood apparatus for describing a deterministic machine which computes something. Right? I mean, it's, it's, it's hard to define a model of computation. There is no fixed definition of what a model of computation is. We define computable. You know, the bet, what, what we want to do is define computable. We define computable by, by setting some rules, you know, which kind of constitute the model, and then saying that a function or problem is computable if the uh, if the if if it's computable within the model, if it can be implemented uh, within the model. So I mean, a theoretical model of computation. There's more. There's there's tons of options. For example, you know, take your favorite programming language. That is technically a theoretical model of computation. You know, if, if, you know, C, C, you know, C programming. You've got a, you've got a language. You're allowed to write, you know, finite programs. You, you write a program in, and, and basically you can say, you know, a function is computable if I can write a, a, a program in C that does it for me. And, and that's just, that's just as much of a definition of computable as our Turing machine definition. And that's the same for any, any programming language. Um, so there's tons and tons and tons of models of computation, and it's not really like a, a, a fixed definition. It's not really like there's not like one kind of object that gives you a model of computation even. Um, so this is not a theorem. It, it's, it's, a th it's a statement of kind of, a, it's an assertion. It's a philosophical assertion. Um, and, and basically, it's, there's a lot of ways to state it, but maybe one way to state it, state it is this, right? If I define computable by it can be implemented within the model, so I can say, you know, call a function computable if it can be implemented in Java. Call a function computable if there's a Turing machine that decides it. Call a function computable if there's a formula you can write out in like the lambda calculus for it. There's a lot of ways to say this, but you know, um, but we can always define the class R. We can always define, right? The bottom line is that we spell out a model of computation and then we say it's computable if it can be implemented within the model. That's what we say. So I can always define computable kind of in this way. No matter what I'm talking about, no matter what my model is, I can say it's computable if it can be implemented within the model. And so I can always define the set of all computable functions, of all computable problems. We'll show later, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll justify later why the set of all fun computable functions is more or less the same. As the set of all computable problems, um, uh, call it R. So one way to state the Church-Turing thesis is to basically say R is the same set, regardless of the model. That's one way to say it. Uh, in other words, the set of all computable problems is the same set, uh, regardless of what's going on. Another, another way is to kind of take a fixed point, like a fixed model of computation, and say it's the best. 
And another, you know, I'll call this, I'll label this the first one. This is one way to say the church turning thesis. Another way to say the church turning thesis is to say uh, any sufficiently uh, a sufficiently sophisticated model of computation is uh, exactly as powerful as a Turing machine. That's maybe the way to say it for us, right? Because we've been developing the Turing machine model. So any, any sufficiently sophisticated, there's weaker models of computation. We can talk about, you know, there's push down automata, there's, there's a finite state machines. There, there's, there's, ver there's models of computation that are weaker than the Turing machine model. But if you have a sufficient, if you have a good enough model, if you have a sufficiently sophisticated model, then, you know, the church Turing thesis can be defined as the assertion that it's no more powerful than the Turing machine model. It's exactly the same. Um, that's one. That's a third. That's a second way to say it. Um, a third way to say it is to kind of take the opposite approach. And you know, over here we so with, with the second statement, we sort of define the Turing model as kind of the central model. We can we can have kind of a, a completely decentralized statement of the Church Turing thesis by kind of saying, if I can describe a an algorithm. for solving the problem, then there's implicitly a model there, you know, within some implicit model. It doesn't even matter. I mean, you don't even really need to make, make it that formal. It's sort of, you know, if I can describe an algorithm for solving a problem, then it's computable. You can take this kind of decentralized kind of set setup and basically say, you know, if I can do it, if I can, if I can kind of come up with a with a with a mechanical process that solves the problem, uh, then the problem is computable because there's some natural model for that process that I described. When I if I describe an algorithm for something, there's implicitly a model there, and so that model is as powerful as a Turing machine, and so that problem is computable. So I can kind of, you know, I can take the Church-Turing thesis and basically use it to centralize my theory. I can use it to centralize my theory around the Turing machine model, or I can use it to completely decentralize the theory from any model. And I can say, okay, the model doesn't matter. Uh, and if I can describe an algorithm for it, then it's computable. And this is kind of a crazy statement because it essentially says that nothing we've done so far matters. Now, that's not true. You know, we, we need some fixed model to talk rigorously about stuff. Um, but, you know, you can kind of get the sense from this that the model does not matter. Um, Maybe the fourth maybe say way to say it is that the model does not matter. And so and you know, there's there's more than even this. There's a lot of there's a, there's still more ways to say to talk about the church turing thesis. But the, you, you get the idea. The church turing thesis is a statement, it's it's an assertion about the equivalence between all of these different possible models of computation that anyone could ever come up with. And, you know, there's no, there's no proof of the Church-Turing thesis. There's no fixed way to justify it completely. Uh, but the more you do stuff, the more you see it. And, and so that's one of the reasons why we went through all those robustness facts. We kept doing, we kept making edits to our Turing machine model. And, and no matter what we did, it never got any more powerful. And, and I even started kind of and and it, since it's based off that natural graph paper thing, you know the Church Turing thesis, is, you know the Turing model is na is the natural one in the sense that it kind of naturally relates to a person doing something on paper, um, and that's kind of what. So that maybe connects to this third one here, and I even invoked that a few times when I was building my uh, my my universal Turing machine. I said, all right, logarithms. I don't care about logarithms right now. I can do those on paper, since I can do a logarithm on paper. I can do it. Uh, <laughs> I can do it on the. I can do it via the, the the Church Turing thesis on a Turing machine. That's sort of an invo That's sort of like a lesser invocation of the Church Turing thesis. So, the Church Turing thesis is sort of a, a centraling, 
a central like philosophical thing that we need to make sure that we are aware of before proceeding forward. It basically says that the, the model that we've developed, while it is valuable in terms of having a rigorous idea of what we're going to be talking about from here on, we're talking more or less about, when we talk about computability, we're talking about far more than just Turing machines. Maybe I'll write that down. Um, the Church-Turing thesis confirms that when we are proving facts about Turing machines, uh, we are proving facts about computability in general. So all of these are going to be important to note. You know, I can invoke the Church-Turing thesis by describing an, a, a mechanical algorithm for solving a problem without actually giving you a Turing machine for it. We'll do, we, you know, that's the thing that people really hate about computability theory, like the, the people that are real sticklers for mathematical rigor and like justification. Uh, and so we'll use that as little as possible, but it's almost impossible to completely avoid using the Church-Turing thesis sometimes in that regard. But, but even beyond that, it sort of also matters in the sense that you know, it, it confirms that what we're going to be doing in the future is, 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 is relates to far more than just Turing machines. Um, one last thing. The strong Church-Turing thesis. is the assertion, let me, is, is this. The, the, the easiest way to kind of think about the strong Church-Turing thesis is to look back at the first thing I said. The Church-Turing thesis was the statement that R is the same set regardless of the model. The strong Church-Turing thesis, I'll restate this later, but the strong, the strong Church-Turing thesis is the assertion that P is the same set regardless of the model. Now, what is P? P is the set of all problems that can be decided efficiently. Not just, a, not just computable problems, but efficiently computable problems. Um, now, we saw two, now, now, we saw that two string Turing machines, two tape Turing machines, were technically faster uh, on some problems in one tape Turing machines, but not in a way that affects the set P. So that, that doesn't challenge the strong Church Turing thesis. We're just talking about, you know, the set of decently efficient things is still decently efficient, however you define efficiency. And, and, and that, th that, sort of, that sort of relates to this assumption we made when we were talking about difficulty in general, when we were talking about operationalizing our notion of difficulty by kind of defining, you know, what we said before, I think, was that What we said before that is that if a problem is difficult, then it will always consume a large amount of some resource um, in any model of computation. This was kind of the fundamental assertion that we taught that we like started with in order to kind of justify that we can analyze the difficulty of problems via resource consumption in some model of computation. Uh, now, you know, there's an assumption here too that kind of uh, that that we have some notion of time efficiency for any model, um, and so. There's, there's a lot to say here. I mean, I mean this isn't going to be our full discussion of the strong Church-Turing thesis. But right now, uh, quantum computers uh, pose a direct challenge to the strong Church-Turing thesis. That it, I, I, I want people to understand this. A lot of people believe quantum computers are just magic. 
No, quantum computers cannot do anything more than a Turing machine can do. We, nobody, nobody on Earth doubts the strong. The, no, nobody is going to deny. Nobody doubts the Church Turing thesis. We still have never found a, a model of computation. This, the Church Turing thesis, deeply relates to like what we think of as computability in general, uh, algorithmic processes in general, as we think of them, bound the Church Turing thesis. However, there's a lot of of uh, wiggling kind of going on here. This is a much less rigorous claim. Um, and, and, and so quantum computers, they pose a challenge to the strong church theory thesis, not the, not the regular church theory thesis. So basically what I mean by that is like we can define BQP. This is essentially the quantum version of P. Uh, and, and it's the case, it seems like uh, P is uh, strictly contained, is, is properly contained It seems like P is properly contained in BQP, that is to say that PQ, BQP is a distinctly bigger class Now that's not proven, but it seems that way. And and in fact, it is the case that if BQP is equal to P, uh, then I believe it ends up being the case that P is equal to NP, which uh, is, pro is is almost certainly not the case. So it's it's almost certainly the case that BQP is not equal to BQP. However, not only is BQP an R, BQP is actually uh, a subset of P space polynomial space usage. So, I mean, it's really like, it's, it's not a gigantic improvement. I mean, it is in terms of practical practicality, but in terms of the big picture of what's computable, right, we've got, you know, P, here's the big class of recursive functions, gigantic. And, and then here's P space, baby old P space. So here this is R, this is P space, you know, this is P, and then this is like BQP. It's not even it's it's a, it's not only a subset of R. It's a subset of P space. So it's it's really like you know. Temper your expectations, I guess, is what I'm saying with regards to quantum computers. They have a lot to offer, but they're not magic. Um, and and so this is exactly where they stand right now. We'll talk more about those later. But I I, I felt like before we move on, we really should have uh, we really should kind of try, you know talk about the church turning thesis. So that's what we did. Hi. Me again. Uh, I just wanted to correct myself. I said earlier in this video that uh, if P is equal to BQP, then P also is equal to NP. Um, that is extremely unlikely to be the case because it's very unlikely uh, for various reasons that uh, NP is contained in BQP, uh, but it is not necessarily, that's not a logical statement that if P is equal to BQP, then uh, P is also equal to NP. That, that could still be the case. It's it's a, uh, or that, that it could still be the case that P is equal to BQP, uh, but P is not equal to NP. That could still happen. Um, probably not, but it could. So I just wanted to correct myself.